Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the A Crowd Town Hall on the CMA Challenge. It has been an overwhelming uh, experience uh, just uh, being the organizers of this challenge. And it has been overwhelming also to see the kind of participation we got on this problem. So this problem basically started with a bunch of discussions on can we actually use, uh, you know, the initial idea was just to kind of uh, think on can we actually use uh, 3D convolutions to um, and make them work on the seismic data. And these were the initial conversations with some partners who have been working for decades on uh, seismic data and analyzing them uh, in different uh, ways for uh, a whole, for a whole variety of uh, use cases. Now, in this particular uh, context, when we got started, we had some expectations in terms of what the participants would be able to achieve. But our, um, our uh, broader expectations were completely blown. And in this particular uh, competition, we also experimented with this whole idea of uh, explain by community, where we try to incentivize the community to come up with resources where they're not just competing, but they're also kind of helping others to um, get started on these problems. Because at the end of the day, our goal is not to kind of have a competition where someone wins, someone loses. We want to build a community of researchers who can come together to solve these hard problems. And without taking a lot more time, I would like to kind of invite the next person who would be uh, speaking uh, right after me. And that would be um, Mike. And uh, the discussions around this particular challenge in the context of an AA crowd challenge basically started uh, with Mike, where Mike has been extremely involved in planning out and orchestrating almost all the administrative details of how to pull off something like this to sitting down and writing code on how to ensure that you know all participants are having a really good experience and that is a very rare trait we get to see among these hundreds of competitions that we have organized so on that note i would let mike jump in give us sh uh, a short background um, of where he comes from and then just jump in on this problem that he's so passionate about mike the floor is okay let me um let me do this let me share my screen And hope you can all see that. Uh, so uh, Rushank, uh, Bahanti, um, thank you for that kind introduction for the opportunity to address this town hall uh, on the Seismic Facies Identification Challenge uh, sponsored by SEAM AI. Um, let me say at the start, the project members, uh, I'll show you who they are uh, in a minute. The seven member companies of the project have been delighted by the enthusiastic response to the first round of the challenge. Very much looking forward to hearing from the AI crowd community uh, today about their uh, reaction, their experience with the challenge and to getting round two of the competition started later this week. Uh, and in direct response to um, to Mahanti's comment about my writing code, let me confess that all of my code was written in MATLAB. I would turn it over in MATLAB to uh, to Mahanti and and his team, who would convert it into Python code. I just started learning Python uh, in a uh, workshop uh, training workshop that was run by the American Association of Petroleum Geologists uh, in August, and I'm looking forward to getting more into it. Actually, it's been a lot of fun. Um, What I wanted to do uh, in my brief remarks to start things off on our side is to, uh, as Mahanti uh, indicated, say a few words about the CIM AI project itself, uh, about our motiv motivations for picking this problem of seismic facies identification for the project's first public competition, and about our plans going forward for other challenges in machine learning and applied air science. You'll see there's, there's no lack of, of interesting problems out there. Um, so first, a few words about Seam AI. Um, the project was launched in September of last year. It's the fifth in a series of collaborative research projects organized uh, and managed since 2007. So we're more than a dozen years now uh, by an entity called Seam Corporation, which is a subsidiary of the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. And SEG, as it's usually called, is the world's largest professional society for applied or science, mainly organized around the oil and gas industry, but applications in all kinds of other uh, areas, environmental monitoring, groundwater, uh, et cetera, in applied air science. Um, SEG organizes these SEAM projects under a subscription model in which member companies join to provide budget and technical staff to define the project's goals 
and carry out its work under the direction of management and technical committees composed from technical staff uh, of the different project members, along with the project manager, which is my role. CMAI started with seven member companies. So uh, you can see their logos at the bottom of the slide, four large international, uh, five large international uh, oil companies, Chevron, the Chinese oil company, CNOOC, Saudi Aramco, Shell, and Total, and two technology companies, Schlumberger, which is the world's largest provider of geophysical services, and a small startup company called Zarathus. More about Zarathus later. Um, we're hoping to add another member uh, before the end of the year. Project has two main goals. Uh, first is to advance the state of the art in applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence in applied earth science with a focus on the exploration and management of underground reservoirs. Um, and as part of that first goal, we're planning to run a series of competitions and then also build some infrastructure supporting machine learning communities, bringing together geoscientists and data scientists, as Mohanty mentioned, to work on big data challenges and applied earth science. CMAI is the, is the first SIEM project on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, earlier SIEM projects were devoted mostly to building highly realistic, hyper-realistic virtual earth models. You see some examples uh, of those models on this slide in various 3D and cutaway displays. The goal of those models was to address different challenges in the management of underground petroleum reservoirs. Uh, SEAM is now planning projects to extend what has been learned about oil and gas reservoirs to the management of reservoirs for underground storage of carbon dioxide to mitigate climate change and to the manage of underground, management of underground water reservoirs. So why synthetic models? Um, what you see here are the data that are generated by these synthetic models. Simulations run on SEAM's virtual models produce seismic data that is essentially indistinguishable from the kind of field data that was the starting point for the seismic image that you were analyzing in this um, seismic facies identification uh, challenge. Uh, that data is real data from the Parahaka Basin in New Zealand, uh, but you can actually produce synthetic data that looks very much like real data. And we plan to use these synthetic data and images for future competitions in which we won't need a geological expert like Bruce uh, Power to interpret the image. Uh, we're not trying to put Bruce out of a job. Um, well, maybe a little bit. Uh, but uh, in fact, for those synthetic models, the geologists have already done their work in building the digital model itself, which can then serve as ground truth for any interpretation, whether by a human expert or a machine learning algorithm. A few words about the motivation for picking seismic facies identification for this first competition. Bruce will go into a lot more detail about that in his talk. Um, as far as we know, this is the first public competition um, involving a multi-way classification of features or pixels in a seismic image. There have been previous challenges, uh, highly successful ones, on other machine learning platforms involving binary classification of seismic images. Does a pixel in a seismic image lie on a fault? You know, there's a fault that passes through uh, the um, a slice through that um, Parahaka data set, um, or does a pixel in, lie inside a type of underground structure called the salt dome, which is particularly important in regions where oil and gas accumulate uh, in underground reservoirs. In this case, as you know, the challenge is to classify and identify each pixel according to whether it lies in one of six different facies. As Bruce will explain in his talk, that's really a toy example. Uh, a full facies interpretation uh, for this Parahaka data set or virtually any other real seismic data set uh, would involve many more classes, 30, 50, sometimes even more than that. More important is when the CMAI project started, we surveyed the member companies about their priorities uh, in applications of machine learning and produced this list. I won't go through the full thing. I just wanna point out, as you can see, that seismic facies identification and other problems in the interpretation of seismic images landed at the top of the list because it was seen both as a high priority. So one here is highest priority and as relatively low technical difficulty. You can see 1.5 is relatively easy, at least initially viewed by the project members. So this was seen as low hanging fruit, fruit uh, for, for machine learning. Uh, won't go through the rest of the list. Uh, the message here is simply that we've identified at least five other classes of problems in geophysical remote sensing, 
of underground uh, fluid reservoirs, which have a similar priority as seismic facies identification. So physical property modeling at different spatial scales, for example, uh, and are perceived as much higher in difficulty uh, than seismic facies interpretation. We will see whether that bears out when we actually run these challenges. And in the next two years, we do plan to issue a series of competitions exploring these other challenges. Um, this is um, my last slide that um, plan to issue um, future challenges. That's the last bullet point on this slide. In the meantime, we look forward to running round two of the seismic facies challenge in the next four to six weeks. Uh, as you'll see in, in the town uh, hall uh, panel discussion, uh, we've devised some new metrics for scoring round two based on what we saw in round one from you all and then a parallel challenge that was run as part of a workshop on machine learning held at the 90th anniversary meeting of the SEG, which took place about a month ago uh, online. Uh, Minjun Park from Stanford uh, School of Earth um, Energy and Environmental Sciences will talk later about his work on that challenge. Uh, also important is that uh, participants in round two will be given access to an experimental platform for machine learning and applied earth science, which CMAI is developing in collaboration with its member company, Zerathis. And finally, uh, we are making plans with the GPU manufacturer, NVIDIA, uh, to co-host a virtual multi-day workshop hackathon on machine learning and applied earth science. Uh, that will take place early in 2021. And we hope to make an announcement about that event uh, in December. So uh, Mahanti Vrushank, that's all I wanted to talk about, at least in my introduction. I have some more slides to talk about metrics, et cetera, but let's save those for the, for the panel discussion. Um, yep. Can take a couple of questions if there's time or we can move on directly to Bruce. Uh, so I can also- I think the broader Sorry, go on, Mohanty. Okay. Yeah, so I think the bro broader idea is uh, we wrap up these questions. And uh, on that note um, is the next speaker is also quite amazing, as amazing as uh, Mike, um, because he is the ground truth that your solutions were compared with. So Bruce has been labeling all the data, uh, which we kind of use uh, to train all the models that all of you submitted and also to kind of evaluate um, all of them. But before we uh, go to... Um, uh, uh, Good to have uh, Bruce uh, come in and kind of uh, speak and share a lot of very interesting insights across a whole uh, broad of topics that many of you are definitely curious about. There's a few uh, house rules and a few broad uh, logistical tasks that we will have to talk about. Uh, one is we really would love to know where all of you are from. So one thing I would suggest is to get used to, you know, there's this little chat button somewhere down uh, on this Zoom panel that you're using. Just go in and just uh, type in there, say, hey, I my name is so-and-so. I am from... Uh, Switzerland. Right now, I'm somewhere else in the middle of uh, Switzerland. So, and if you do that, that also helps us get a perspective of where all of you are from. Apart from that, there's also the Q and A features in um, uh, uh, the again at the bottom panel of uh, the Zoom panel, where you can ask questions while the speakers are kind of addressing. And we will be kind of curating many of those quish, uh, questions and ensuring they are at some point addressed uh, in the uh, panel discussion that we have at the end, uh, hoping that we have uh, enough time. And apart from that, without taking much of the time, I would love to kind of introduce uh, Bruce uh, to kind of uh, come in and uh, share his insights on this problem. And also he actually, it would be also be good to kind of listen a little bit on his experience of also annotating the data and uh, looking at hundreds of people training machine learning models, which learn from his data to try and compare the solutions from it. So Bruce, uh, the flo floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Can everyone hear me to begin with? Uh, yeah, yes. coming through fine. Bruce. All right, thanks. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen and go to a PowerPoint here. And again, let me know when you can see this. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yep, up now, Bruce. All right, thanks. Um, so as uh, Vashank said, uh, my name is uh, Bruce Power. Uh, I work for Chevron Corporation in Houston, Texas. Uh, I've been with Chevron for about 29 years. So I've been interpreting seismic data um, for a while now. Um, so I don't know whether I would call myself the ground truth or any other such exalted term, although I'm gonna try and make my wife refer to me as the ground truth from now on, see how that goes. Um, but uh, I think perhaps the, the thing that 
we could regard me as for the purposes of this um, exercise and this, this sort of uh, discussion is, I, I am a geological interpreter and the interpretation I have made is probably uh, similar to, perhaps a little better, perhaps a little worse than any other experienced geological interpreter would make of seismic data. Um, so we can think of it that way. And I'll discuss some of the, uh, the, the issues around seismic interpretation with respect, particularly with respect to making those interpretations transparent and usable by AI, by machine learning uh, convolutional neural networks. There are a lot of issues involved in how our current workflows are set up because they weren't really set up um, for the interpretation to then be um, ported into a convolutional neural network. So let's just go ahead with that. Um, we're gonna talk mostly about the Parihaka um, data set. Uh, which is the one we used for um, this CMAI challenge. Um, and we're gonna focus on that. So machine learning for interpretation of seismic data. Um, the use of a convolutional neural network to, to help uh, understand and learn to segment and classify what we refer to as facies. Um, and facies are really nothing more than a three-dimensional sort of collection of rocks with similar properties with respect to the interpretation you're making. So if you're not familiar with that term facies, that's how it applies for, um, for subsurface purposes, for geological purposes. But they're really challenged because there is a lack of training data that is available. So if you think of other AI problems like ImageNet, you have ImageNet that sits out there that you can pre-train networks on to understand uh, the properties of a two-dimensional uh, image. Um, in the medical field, there's a lot of growing databases uh, around all sorts of medical image technology um, that can be used and made available for training. We don't have that, at least in terms of something that's publicly available in, in the earth science field. Um, and non-convolutional neural network workflows, sort of other types of machine learning, things such as random forest and, uh, and other types of say shallower um, uh, machine learning applications, they are challenged by the non-uniqueness of the seismic data and facies with respect to the underlying geological properties. One th thing that you need to keep in, in mind about this is this is simply a recording of sound waves that have been shot through the earth they're bouncing back and that they're being um, collected by receivers and then processed. So they are not exactly what you would refer to as a, as, as an, a picture of the earth so much as um, a representation of it. So each of these um, reflectors that we see here um, simply reflects a change in properties within the earth. And depending on the frequency of this data, the deeper you go, each one of these reflectors represents a thicker interval of the earth. You're talking about each one of these reflectors, um, each one of these cycles that goes from say a dark black peak here to a dark black peak here, representing anywhere from as little as five meters of earth to as much as two or 300 meters of earth. And so there's an awful lot of, of, of rock and an awful lot of properties that can uh, be present within these um, intervals. So there's a lot of non-uniqueness with respect to uh, what these reflectors and, and what these amplitudes and what the seismic data itself reflects. So with respect to these facies, uh, current interpretation workflows don't easily allow for the creation of systematic labels for seismic data that are easily utilized. Um, so industry and academia, we need to create training data either by extensive labeling of real seismic data volumes or creation of synthetic volumes, similar to the ones Mike discussed before. The problem there being that each one of those synthetic volumes uh, involves an enormous amount of work to create. They're, they're not easy to create um, large numbers of synthetic volumes to cover the wide variety of, of, of um, essentially different types of geology one might encounter. So creating synthetic volumes that have enough detail to them is, is a rather Herculean task at the moment. So we're gonna play around with real seismic data, but that 
ultimately means that we don't have the truth as an answer when we're we're, we're measuring up our our predictions against it. We simply have an interpretation that we measure against. Uh, this Perry Hawke seismic data is a very useful data volume to, to work with, uh, largely because it's relatively modern, um, but also it's, it's publicly available and freely available, not just publicly available, but freely available to anyone who wants it. Uh, so that's kind of the one of the main reasons why we're using this data is that it's free and publicly available. It's relatively modern, good quality data set. Uh, it's relatively shallow depths below the mudline, uh, Pleistocene. Those are geologic ages, if you're not familiar with that, which means that it's relatively high bandwidth in terms of um, the seismic signal. So it's reasonably good quality. Um, it has a lot of interesting stratigraphic features. It has a well-developed fault system. Uh, you can see some of the stratigraphic features here. These breaks in the data here, these are the faults. Um, so there's an awful lot going on in here, which is both good and bad. Um, that it creates challenges in that it's stru structurally and stratigraphically complex. Um, there are a large number of potential seismic facies and their facies are not always easily segmented for training. I won't get into the details of how I went about segmenting this unless people are particularly interested, but it's not a simple task using the current interpretation platforms that we utilize to essentially assign a mask so that every pixel in the volume has a facies label associated with it. Um, as I said before, the current interpretation workflows are not really designed to do that. Uh, because there's a lot of facies, um, there are a lot of compromises that I ended up making in the labeling uh, that can make validation metrics misleading in small regions. Um, we can discuss that a little bit later if you want. Um, it's, it's kind of potentially a rather open-ended conversation that would take up the rest of my time. Um, there's going to be a lot of, there's a serious issue with class bias um, in any interpretation in that the most significant facies in terms of what we're interested in are often not the most abundant. They often might be the least abundant. And so class bias is enhanced by increasing the number of facies. The more facies you have, the less common some of them are going to be. Um, this is actually a relatively sand poor volume in terms of, of what you're looking at here. Uh, most of this is mudstone, shale, very fine grained sediment. There's relatively little coarse grain sand size material in here, which makes for a lack of lithology contrast. Uh, and in the deeper sections, there are presence of volcanic rocks in some regions, which causes some imaging issues. Um, just quick geology here. Um, we're looking here at the Perihaka seismic surveys outlined here in red. Uh, it's in what's called the Taranaki Basin off the west coast of the North Island of New Zealand. It's deposited as a result of this basin forming as a result of the Australian plate that is subducting under the Pacific plate here. Uh, that process of plate tectonics is what's responsible for New Zealand existing um, um, as that subduction creates essentially the islands, uh, the volcanic islands, the North and South Island of New Zealand. We're gonna be looking at, again, these plyo Pleistocene sediments here as part of a back arc basin. Everything we're looking at is either in the lower half of it is what's called the Manga Formation, and the upper half of it is the Giant Forsets Formation. So if we look at this, you can see here on the left is an uninterpreted seismic line. Um, and then on the right, here is an interpretation of what a stratigraphic framework through this system might look like. And again, this is just one interpretation. It's my interpretation. Another geologist might interpret this somewhat differently. There'd likely be some commonality to it. Um, we'd both be interested in trying to identify these, these incisional um, channel systems here, these incisional canyon systems, but somebody might be more interested in, in trying to um, separate out these turbidites in the manga formation here. And so you might interpret it differently. Um, but basically everything below this light blue line is the manga formation. Everything above it is the giant forceps formation. But each one of these horizons have been, has been picked uh, manually, essentially. They've been identified by me by looking at the patterns and saying, I think this horizon is important. Um, it separates out rocks above it 
from the rocks below it. And I think it's a meaningful geological surface. So the whole idea is essentially, can we teach a neural network to understand essentially the pattern recognition that's going on in my head when I pick out these horizons? But as you can see, there's a lot of them. So how do you attach labels to these things? So we need to somehow create a mask to do this so we can take this horizon or the, these things and turn it into something that looks like this. So now every pixel on this seismic line, in fact, every pixel in this volume has a label uh, attached to it. Um, and that is the process that unfortunately now is quite difficult to do. And so there's some work that needs to be done in creating workflows uh, that allow us to do that more easily. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of different labels that I might want to apply to this. And some of them are not very common, such as you know these guys here, this guy here, these guys here. But these are actually the things that are, to me, the most interesting in this uh, volume. This big purple interval at the top, is very abundant, but I'm actually not that interested in it. I need to sec I, I need to segment it and label it to put it aside as much as anything else. Um, so because we have so many labels, um, we need to make some compromises and lump some of these together. Otherwise, we're simply going to have too many to deal with. Um, when I mapped this originally, I had 28 different phases regions. I can't have 28 different labels, simply because some of those labels will have very, very few pixels assigned to them. There won't be enough data available uh, for training the network on those pixels. So we, we need to um, make some compromises. And some of these compromises include things such as lumping together um, this interval here with this interval up here, because they have certain similarities in their pattern to them, in spite of the fact that they're actually geologically quite different underlying that. So that th those are rather unsatisfying things from the point of view of a geologist that I, that I ended up doing for this challenge. Um, at some point, if we could figure out a way of dealing with class bias in an effective way, I would certainly like to separate out a lot of these faces back to this original um, more um, granular uh, uh, classification. Uh, this isn't going to mean very much, but um, these are essentially the six groupings of facies that we came up with. Um, you know, basically one down here is the basement, um, basically very, very low signal to noise. You can see that there's not a lot of pattern in this signal. It's very chaotic. Um, this blue facies, which essentially is, is sort of lower amplitude slope and basin mudstones. Um, this facies here, number three, has a lot of um, internal discordances and chaotic reflectors. It's a result of something we call mass transport deposits. Essentially, it's a, land, a submarine landslide. Um, uh, four, again, is slope basins and mudstones. Again, this, this these ones here are much higher amplitude than the blue facies here. Um, facies five, this is a, a, an uncommon facies. Uh, and so from the class bias perspective, this is maybe the most problematic, but it's also one of the most interesting. Um, these are incisional small channels within the slopes, uh, mudstones that likely contain sandstone. They're called slope valleys. And then we also have these much more obvious incisional canyon systems, which contain a lot of disruptive facies. Um, and the interesting thing, if we want to think about what these patterns mean, um, this is essentially um, a surface um, view along the base of this canyon system here. Um, that, and as you can see, that when you can see that there's an awful lot of detail. Um, and intricate patterns that these incisional canyons uh, represent. And essentially, this is the interpretation that I can make. And the challenge to the AI crowd is, can you get to this status? Because if you can get here, then as Mike says, I, to some extent, you can put me out of work, which at my age is maybe not such a bad thing. Um, but there's a, a lot of differences in here, but this is sort of the challenge is, you, is AI needs to be able to segment the data this well so that I can get this picture out of what AI segments. 
So um, that's really about all I have to say on this. Um, these faces that I created here were primarily for the Pleistocene sediments. My primary focus when I made these, this interpretation was on looking at the submarine canyon and slope sediments of the giant forsets formation. Um, you know, if we were actually looking for uh, oil and gas reservoir faces um, in this volume, I'd actually spend a lot more time uh, looking at the turbidite sections in the upper manga formation. Um, and again, let me emphasize, this is simply one interpretation. Um, uh, you know, when you crowdsource labeling for other challenges, you know, you might put it up to 100 x-ray radiologists or 1,000 x-ray radiologists and see how they'd all interpret the same x-ray. Um, you only got one of me at the moment. So it's not necessarily the absolute truth. It is just a version. Um, and for the purposes of, of, of our project, we didn't make any attempt to map the extensive fault systems. Um, that is in fact something that many people are most interested in in this data for is they use it as a, as a data set for, for identifying faults. And again, uh, we would like to acknowledge the government of New Zealand, uh, Department of Petroleum and Minerals uh, for providing access to this data. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Bruce, this is um, this is Mike again. Um, uh, just a, a couple of comments. Um, um, we want to thank um, Government of New Zealand and CMAI and um, AI Crab wants to thank Chevron uh, for kindly providing uh, the uh, your interpretation uh, under a Creative Commons license uh, for this challenge and for the CMAI uh, SEG workshop that I mentioned. You might want to say how long it took you to do this, actually. So you know that's what we're trying to speed up. Um yeah uh to make the interpretation at the scale i made it at for this volume um took a couple of months okay um probably anywhere from let's say two to three months um now it's a little hard for me to exactly nail that down because it was not something that i did full time that i sat down and did it and so i tried to back calculate how much time it, it took so the the problem is, is in order to um, get a detailed interpretation of those submarine canyon systems, you need to interpret the data on a fairly tight grid. Um, if you're not familiar with interpreting seismic data, essentially, even though it's called, it's called a three-dimensional volume or 3D volume, you, you interpret it still one two-dimensional slice at a time to some extent. Um, you, you interpret on what's called a grid. And then you try to fill in that grid. And in order to get a detailed interpretation that satisfied me, I had to interpret on a fairly tight grid. Okay. Um, so I'd say, you know, maybe somebody else could interpret it quicker than me. Other people might take more time. Um, it, it's, but I, I think sort of two to three months is a reasonable um, estimate of how long it might take somebody to interpret this. And that would be a typical length for uh, a interpretation that would be involved in an actual exploration play, but that interpretation would be revisited many times in the course of development. Yeah, I mean, that's just it. This is, this is just, this would, I would regard this as an initial interpretation. If I was to, you know, this was an exploration play or, or then this interpretation would get revisited many times. And in reality, you're talking many months to potentially two to three years worth of interpretation. So. Yeah, and ultimately that's what we're hoping to speed up or at least have uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence contribute to the efficiency of that type of operation. Um, Mahanti, we could maybe take a couple questions for Bruce or if you wanna move on, I, I'll introduce briefly uh, Minyan um, and we'll, we'll continue on with the panel. Most of the air crowd team will hate me because I had a few burning questions. Before okay. that, I would let the you know viewers uh, kind of basically know that you can actually ask questions in the chat in the Q and A forum, and if you do not, I will hog all your time, and uh, my team will give me a hard time for hogging onto a lot of time. So I had a few very interesting questions because Bruce, your talk was actually a lot more interesting than actually as interesting and uh, even a lot more than uh, I was told to expect from this talk. And especially given that, again, I do not have a lot of domain expertise on this problem, but I kind of love a lot of deep learning stuff and machine learning stuff. 
and I played with this data before any of you participants actually got access to that. So I used my privilege and it was like a kid in a candy store, but many of my initial uh, attempts actually showed how difficult the problem is. From your talks, I had a few key questions that I actually uh, wanted to ask. And if participants uh, raise up some questions, I'll be happy to kind of uh, give them the floor. Until then, I will keep asking a few questions while we still have time. Um, my first question is, I, again, many of these questions can be asked in the panel discussion, but I somehow feel that asking these questions now will also help uh, give context to the broader talk. My first question was, if we had another Bruce uh, who um, was as good as you, you know, enough experience, similar, the same one, just in different timelines, multiverses, then in context of these two annotators who are kind of annotating this data, what would you think would be the agreement uh, in terms of uh, the labels? Uh, agreement in terms of what? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last word. You uh, Agreement in terms of the labels. For example, uh, Bruce was... Oh, um, well, let me just... Um... I would think the agreement in terms of the most abundant labels would probably be reasonably good. Um, if you're looking for a quantitative answer, you, the, one of the things that we'd have to do to begin with is have a discussion about what we were interpreting the data for, okay? Because uh, the, the faces that you would identify to some extent would be driven by what your interpretation goal was. As I said before, um, at, at the end there, I said, when I interpret it, I was mostly interested in trying to segment out what I call the submarine canyon facies and the slope valley facies and the giant forceps formation. If my goal had been to identify the turbidite sands and the manga formation, which is the lower half of the data, I would have interpreted rather differently. So I would have had different labels. So you, you, you might want to um, put it as, as let me think about this for a second to give you a, a, an analog or a comparison. Um, you know, if for instance, you were segmenting images for self-driving automobile guidance systems, if your goal was to segment the obstacles uh, in the image rather than the people, you might segment it differently. You know, for stationary objects versus say movable objects, you might, if your goal was only to segment and classify objects that might move, things like a dog, a ball, a child, a human being, uh, another car, you might segment it differently than if your goal was to classify all the things that don't move, like a building, a, a tree, mm -hmm. although you could argue a tree might move if it's windy. Um, mm -hmm. But it, <laughs> you know, but it, it, if we had the same goal, I would say that we could probably say our agreement would be somewhere between 80 to 90%, but it would be unlikely to get above that. That's actually a very good answer because you know when you look at the similar uh, questions in context of natural language processing where people have to uh, answer on sentiments and whatnot, 80, 90% is like a huge, uh, <laughs> you know, a huge um, benchmark in uh, a huge threshold in many cases. So that's already a good sense. If you actually can, uh, if you have your intuitive answer to the question is 80, 90%, it's uh, a good start. But I will not stop on my questions until people, people uh, start asking questions or I'll ask two or three more questions that I, these are burning questions I had. So uh, at one point you were talking about, uh, you know, especially in this context, when, uh, how given the con context of the question, your answers to that questions might change. But let's hold on the thought and build up on the thought is, let's say on, in this hypothetical case, which is probably illegal in uh, AI crowds terms, uh, terms and service. Uh, so if our legal team is uh, looking at this, please ignore this uh, next segment. If uh, some of the participants decided to team up with you and train under you, train under you, and these are people who do not have a lot of experience in annotating say seismic data, how long will it take them to become experts in annotating this data? And oh, using wow. a team of, let's say, 10 people, do you think, uh, how, how would that affect uh, the times that you had mentioned before in terms of annotating a data set like this? Um, much longer. Um, they would have a very difficult time, I, I would think. Um, yeah, I, mean, I shouldn't be that presumptuous. Maybe I'm overestimating how much how much background you need in geology. Um, the, the, the whole key to this, again, is we are interpreting this data 
not necessarily just to segment it for what I'd refer to as the unsupervised textures in the data, but with respect for the underlying geological model. I think that's where the big um, prize is um, for the geological community or the earth science community. Um, for many years, we've actually had the ability to sort of auto-interpret or auto-segment or auto-classify what I'd regard as unsupervised seismic faces and textures. Um, there have been tools out there to do that for a long time. But the problem is, is you end up with an object that you've segmented that's actually of no interest to anybody. Um, because of this non-uniqueness of the data um, and, and the sort of the challenges that the network has on what it's being asked to segment. Um, so being asked to, to segment the data with respect to an underlying geological model is the real crux of the problem, at least from my point of view. Um, otherwise, it's a simpler task, but um, a more useless task would be the way I'd put it. Um, if you're just doing unsupervised segmentation of the data and it says, essentially, then you're just doing clustering and you say, okay, uh, I want you to segment this data into 20 clusters and it will give you the 20 best clusters of the data with respect to texture. Now, none of those clusters may be at all useful to me as a geologist interpreting it. So that's the key. So what I would essentially have to do is at least to some degree, teach your 10 um, AI specialists, um, I'd have to teach them about geology and how to recognize geological patterns and what's meaningful. In but geology. what if we get 10 geologists? Yeah, I'm giving ideas to the participants of the competition. Oh, geologists. If they're, geologists. if they're already geologists and they're, and they're used to interpreting seismic data, then it, it, you know, I don't think it would be a big ask. Sorry, I thought you were asking me if you were just giving no, me- No, 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 okay. The initial <laughs> question was for, uh, um, yeah. was for AI experts from the AI crew community, these participants. Now they have oh, a okay. that they can get geologists in general to annotate the data, but uh, we have some protections against that. Please do not worry about that. We'll get to that. Yeah, no, no. Um, um, depending on their experience level, how much geology they've seen, um, you know, anywhere from I could potentially train them in a couple of days um, to it could take weeks or months. You know, um, some people are are good at understanding concepts in three dimensions. That's another thing that you you need to do to understand the kind of faces that we're looking at, you need to remember that that seismic volume is a three-dimensional representation of the earth. And so you need to understand what all these patterns that you're interpreting are mean in three dimensions. Some people that comes very naturally to them. Other people, it, you know, it's like people who can do math and people who, you know, you often hear people who say, I, I, I don't understand math, right? And other people, math comes very naturally to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that ability to visualize the context in three dimensions is, I'd say the critical factor is in, in, in teaching somebody to interpret. Mm -hmm. All right. To that, I, I basically asked both these questions for this broader build-up question. So uh, at least I get a context and hopefully the rest of uh, the audience does, uh, was mm -hmm. that we first talked about an AI expert who's not a domain expert in uh, geology, who does not have experience mm -hmm. with this data. We talked about a domain expert who you can train in a few days. Now, my question is, if you had access to the best model that we have right now, and uh, from, uh, I'm not sure if you have already seen, uh, you know, the kind of errors it makes and whatnot. But my question is, how much, if we actually imagine an assistive setup, where you are already getting the prediction from the best model we have in this setup, and your task was just to correct these uh, annotations, where all these abundance of uh, uh, labels are already dealt with, these little boundaries are uh, needed to be dealt with, Little boundaries are broad in some cases, some cases, uh, and in, in some cases they're broad, in some cases they're not that broad. My question is, instead of a few months, how much would have uh, it taken you? It can be a lot more. In some cases, correcting the data is all a, a lot of mess. And yeah, I, I, um, I understand. Well, I mean, you basically hit on, you know, what a lot of the research that we're, I'm assuming that other participants in the industry are working on, we certainly are at Chevron, is that's exactly what we're trying to do is we're trying to set up these kind of iterative um, 
beneficial workflows where you can do some interpretation, get a prediction using a model, correct that prediction, and then maybe feed it back and get a second prediction. So the goal is to, um, and I think Mike talked about this at the beginning, the goal is for us to be able to take the time that we interpret from months, many months down to days and weeks, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe even for an initial interpretation as little as hours. Um, I think in all honesty, one of the big problems we face is, is not so much, you know, uh, do we need to improve the network? Do we need a better network? Do we need a better algorithm? Um, we need more training data. Um, that is, you know, the big hurdle we have to climb, especially if we're talking about um, a collaborative community. You know, um, ImageNet is a public resource. Everybody can access ImageNet. One of the negative things about our industry historically is we don't share our data. We don't, you know, we hang on to it. It's proprietary. You know, we'd never show it to those evil French people from Total, you know, um, we would, you know. Hi, Rami. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah. There is an evil French person from Total on this call and part of the project, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, and anyone else who can jump in the call right now, let's just yeah. call it as a pre panel discussion already. Yeah. 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 No. Um, but, uh, you know, historically, we don't share our data with each other in our industry. It's, it's actually, you know, we're not, um, we are not the most open source friendly um, group of people historically. Um, there are an unfortunate number of lawyers that we go through just to be able to present my interpretation of this public data set. There's still hoops and hurdles we have to go through internally. Um, so that is, that is a cultural thing that we need to deal with in our industry if we're going to try to create what I refer to as a public database. Um, and, and Bruce, this is Mike, just a comment. Um, that's one of the goals that SCG has in mind uh, for, for this CMAI project is to start breaking down those barriers. It's hard, it's very hard, but um, uh, I think when the, the industry begins to see some of the benefits that could accrue from that, that they'll start to move in that direction. And it's one of the reasons we'll probably start using the SEAM synthetic data and models, which SEG owns uh, to do that. And those were built, as Bruce said, it took huge uh, three year, four year projects uh, with many more uh, companies contributing. The last CMA project that I um, um, managed had 20 member companies building some of the models that I showed. So uh, there's a long way to go, but we're hopeful to get there. Um, Mahanti, we should probably move on with the other, the, the talks from the participants um, in the competition, and then we'll have some time at the end for the uh, for the panel discussion. So yeah, in the process, just um, for in the process of asking a bunch of questions to Bruce, uh, we managed to kind of somehow display, uh, kind of uh, divide the panel discussion into two parts. But next up, we do have, uh, right now you have been hearing from Mike, Bruce, and uh, these are people who have been working on and really passionate about this problem for quite some time. But many of you are people who got introduced to this problem only, what, a few months ago? And then uh, you got somehow excited and then you started working on it. And then many of you just blew our minds. And it's some people among you that we are going to listen up to next. And I would invite Vrushang to come in and introduce the next speaker uh, right now. Okay. Uh, uh, so next speaker we have is Minyun. Uh, Minyun, you here? He's a, a PhD student at Stanford School of Earth Sciences, Energy and Environmental. Uh, and uh, he was one of the winners of a part of a workshop that was organized by SEAM that is adjacent to this challenge. So, Minyun, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Go on. Uh, Minion, in case you are speaking, we can't hear you. Yes, yeah, 
You don't know. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, yeah, sorry for that. Go on. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Min Jun Park. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for the sponsors to organize this such a nice opportunity. Um, I'm really enjoying it. And my talk will be some sort of general introduction uh, about the method that I did for, the, for this project. And the title of this talk will be Toward the Better Deep Learning Solution. So let me begin with uh, some problem space. You can see uh, the empty space. And you can think this space as uh, some sort of probably space of the possible solution. So what we are doing in this stage is for given training data, we, we train the model so that the trained model can fill some of space. And let's say this blue areas as a predictable space. And the goal of our project is to expand these blue areas as much as possible. And the one simplest method to do that is to simply just adopt a better architecture so that with a better architecture, we actually uh, fill the much larger space with the same data set. Let me show you one example for that. Here on the left side is the, you can see the, my first uh, prediction result for the test data. And I adopt, in that case, I, I adopt a customized unit. Um, it was based on the unit I customized a little bit, but uh, it has uh, only a few layers, maybe three or four for each encoder and decoder parts. So it was fast to train, but um, obviously it has a worse feature extraction and low capacity so that you can see some sort of unstable and unreasonable wizard. So I decided to move on, move on to the uh, better architecture, which is called the Deep Lab V3. Um, I think this is the one of the best architecture for the semantic segmentation task. Uh, obviously, it has a deeper, much deeper layer, so it requires a higher cost. And this is because um, it requires a huge memory, and it forces me to decrease the batch size. And you know, like we had we. Need a, we need to put a lot of time for, for the training. But obviously it has a better feature extraction and high capacity. So you can see the, now the result is much stable and the, uh, looks reasonable compared to the previous one. So yeah, let's say we have a kind of the best architecture for solving our problem. But still we have uh, some space to we have to fill. So uh, let me introduce one more method to fill the much more space, which is called the data augmentation. So these blue dots are corresponding to, to the augmented data. And uh, we can actually generate these blue dots by using give it, given red dots, as well as some sort of domain knowledge. And so that we actually the same architecture can fill much larger solution space. Uh, let me introduce some of the data augmentation method I adopt. The most simple, sim the simplest but the efficient method for the data augmentation is flipping. So we can just simply flip the left and right side of the uh, given training data so that we can easily generate the blue dots. Um, what about the up and down flipping? Um, this is that common uh, for the natural image processing, but I don't think this will fit for our case because uh, we know that the this particular class are very located in the top, as well as this class are very located in the bottom. We know that because we are uh, from geophysics and geology, so. I think this is simple, but I think this is important concept why we need uh, some sort of domain knowledge uh, before we adopt deep learning to solve this specific problem. Um, and well, let me introduce one more method. I think this is interesting. Uh, it's called random deformation. 
So what it does is uh, pick the pixel, each pixel, and change the location of each pixel. And then we just simply interpolate using some sort of spline method to construct uh, those kind of three uh, generated images. So now we have uh, uh, three different random deformation results from the one red dot. And each of them has uh, some sort of slightly different structures but it follows uh, some you know, layer preservation. So this can be done as a 3D so we can easily augment the data. Let me show you uh, the example for that. So here you can see the, uh, the result from the without any data augmentation. So it, it requires a lower cost obviously because we have uh, lower data volume. But if you look at the input, especially here and here, it's quite unstable and discontinuous and, and here as well. So let me move on to the data augmentation richard, um, like this one. So if you look at the this channel class, and uh, in here, it's not perfect, but um, we don't have the, this kind of misinterpretation in here. And here as well is, is getting more stable. Also, uh, this is the, the part I like. So sub canyon system, if you look at this area. And if you look at the input, I think um, there is some sort of detachment between the yellow classes and, and the, the data augmentation widget uh, follows that nicely, while the, um, the without augmentation is not following the uh, detachment pattern. But um, there's also the thing that, that I didn't like is that this part, because there is a, a kind of huge fault in here so I think this is kind of a uh, right answer. I'm, I'm not perfectly sure, but uh, in my guess, I think this is the right answer. While the augmented data has, a, has, uh, has changed this part. So I think this is wrong um, answer for this case. And this is because um, if you look at this area, so when we adopt the data augmentation, it is possible uh, to generate this data at the similar probably space like this one. So that the trained network with this augmented data uh, put more weights on this area. So we may lose this yellow uh, possible solution space. So I think that is a similar concept with the overfitting. So I think um, this kind of thing is, is the case of the, this losing this yellow space. So that's why we, we have to be careful when we adopt the data augmentation. We have to be sure the augmented data is well distributed. So, but in this case, just let's assume that we have a really uh, the best architecture and as well as the uh, well-defined data, augmented data. But I, I wanna introduce one more case. Uh, even if we have both of, we meet the both of conditions, we may still have uh, a lot of empty space we have to fill. So what should we do if that's the case? So he, in this case, I think the, the, the only option is to redefine the problem space because it's too large for the given data and the, the architecture. So, more specifically, uh, we have to decrease the size of the problem so that the given data and the architecture can fit the problem. Let me, uh, this is not easy, but sometimes it, it is very uh, efficient and um, good approach. Let me show you one example for that. So here uh, you, on the right side, you can see the uh, prediction research from the validation data set with, uh, with my previous architecture. So this architecture cannot classify the channel class in here. So let's just assume that we cannot get the uh, more data as well as we cannot get the better architecture. So what should you do? 
in that case, the only option we have is to redefine the multi-class classification problem as the kind of binary classification problem, which is much easier to train. So now the, the network's goal is to, is not to classify six class, but classify just one class. So in here, channel class. out um yeah can you help me yeah we can hear you now oh uh, yeah we thank just you. lost you for a second yeah thank you um so here um you can see the now the with the same data and same architecture but it can now classify the channel class very nicely so i think that's the pos one possible uh approach to solve the problem uh, let me conclude my talk. So for the good deep learning solution, we need at least three things. Uh, good network, well-defined problem, and large enough training data. Also, uh, I think um, domain knowledge is also necessary. Uh, in our case, geological background or geophysical background will be uh, the domain knowledge. So we can use that for the, maybe for the post-processing or we can give some constraint for our optimization problem. Or as I mentioned before, we can use this for the data augmentation. So uh, this is the part of part that I'm working on now. So I hope to get the better result as soon as possible. And thank you for your attention. And uh, feel free to contact me uh, whenever you have a question or the uh, feedback. I would be happy to answer and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minjun. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for creating such a nice presentation also. Uh, so everyone, if you do have questions, please, uh, you can always raise your hand. This is an informal town hall. So it's not that only the speakers can talk and not the others. So, uh, you can also use the chat box to make any questions and everything. Uh, thanks a lot, Mijun. We'll move on to the next participant. These are uh, some of the top participants from the challenge that we hosted on AI Crowd. And I'll first invite Haibin. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi. Hi. Yep. Hi. Uh, so uh, I don't prepare any slides, but I just uh, want to share with you some experience I have with this challenge. Uh, my, my name is Haibindi, uh, originally from China, but now is in, in Houston. Uh, my, with some background in geophysics, so uh, I would say this uh, challenge is aligned with my research and work experience, work interest quite well, which is to use machine learning for uh, seismic interpretation, uh, including the seismic phases analysis, which is covered in, in this challenge. So uh, again, the multi, uh, motivation for me to attend this challenge is actually to test a algorithm I have made uh, for a while, uh, since uh, this challenge provides a very good label for, for testing, which is a 3D, 3D fully uh, annotated label in a cube, which is not usually not available in most uh, uh, seismic interpretation projects. Um, another difference I, I uh, observe is uh, of this challenge between the, the previous project I have is the layout between the site, the training and the testing data set. In, in some project, we already have uh, a seismic survey. We don't have a 3D label, but we have a few sections labeled that are distributed in this uh, uh, survey. And the, the our target is to predict uh, with, still within the same survey, which is kind of like a uh, interpolation uh, uh, problem. However, in this one, if you look at the, the layout of the, the survey, we have the training data set as a cube. Then we have two testing data set on both sides, which are outside of the training. So it's like uh, a, a exploration. And of course, it's more challenging than, than the previous uh, other project if we have an interpolation uh, problem. Uh, so uh, I, I want to give thanks to the whole AI crowd and uh, uh, everyone who worked on this project. I enjoyed this challenge uh, uh, quite much. And uh, I, I also, I found this uh, set very, very challenging. Uh, even as uh, Bruce mentioned, even though he only uh, asked uh, us to predict six class, still we, the machine learning for at least my algorithm won't uh, be able to get a good job on all of them. 
um, I noticed for there are two classes uh, of uh, very small amount, which is a class number three and five. Um, but it looks as a Bruce mentioned, they are quite important in geology and uh, looks like the machine learning uh, is not able to do a good job on, on both uh, for now. Uh, also uh, for, for me, I think the, uh, the lower boundary of the last class, the class number six is also difficult to uh, pick by the um, a computer. Uh, so what else? Uh, uh, I I would say the um, the challenge is well prepared. Uh, the major there's a little confusion for me is uh, about the evaluation. Actually, they mentioned they use uh, F1 score, but uh, uh, since we have six classes, we would have six F1s, right? Uh, so I assume we use the average uh, of all these uh, six F1s, but. Uh, if we go to next round, probably it's better to uh, uh, give more hints about how the evaluator score is uh, calculated, right? Um, so, uh, okay, thanks. What else? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, some approach. I mean, so, uh, just want to give uh, some uh, uh, introduction to my approach. I just use a, two, a typical 2D uh, segmentation network, uh, but we do a little bit of uh, uh, slight customization. We introduced a, uh, start, a feature engineering before we doing the segmentation, right? So, and this uh, feature engineer, we build it on both the training and uh, testing data set. And uh, so this uh, can help uh, uh, make the machine know about the, the seismic signals of the whole queue, both the training and data, training and the testing. We, we can uh, reduce the, the, ch the chance of overfitting still, still uh, as uh, as Min Jun uh, mentioned, the overfitting is uh, is always the issue when doing this challenge. Uh, so since we uh, we do the two D, we uh, when we do the prediction, we prediction on both directions and then just uh, merge it simply by uh, taking the average of all the uh, probabilities. So I think that's uh, that's my experience with this. Any any questions, comments? Hi Ben, this is uh, this is Mike uh, Oristaglio. Um, very nice, very nice description of your experience. A couple of things: we will we fully intend to publish the full algorithm for the scoring uh, in uh, in round two, uh, and as you'll see, uh, there will be a weighting for the different F1 scores for each class, and in fact, that weighting will vary depending on the class because. Uh, as you saw, some classes are harder than others, and we're actually going to emphasize them more because they're the more interesting classes that Bruce talked about. Uh, those are classes five and six. In fact, it was a little bit of a you know a tricky part of the test one data set. The test one data set had no class five in it, although the training data set had had class five in it. Um, uh, the test data set for round two will have class five in it um, uh, and uh, be more similar to the training data set. Yeah, yeah, that's, that would be uh, great for this. Uh, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Evan, and thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for the feedback. Thank you, Mike, for answering. Uh, we will move on to the next participant. That's Yunshi. You're here. Yeah. Um, hello. Awesome. Yeah, we can switch on your video, and we'll. Hello, everyone. So my name is Yunshi. I'm currently a data scientist at a tech company, uh, but I just graduated from UT Austin uh, in about half a year ago, six months ago in May. So I was from, previously I was from uh, Sergey Formel's group. Actually, I saw a lot of uh, familiar faces and name here. Uh, I knew Hybin, myself in person, and we met in uh, 2017 in Houston at the SCG. We were playing uh, pool balls uh, uh, during the conference. And, and, and also I saw Constantine, who is currently in, uh, um, I think, Aramco. So pretty good. So um, our participants are not, it's not only myself, we have a team. Uh, so the team is uh, all the alumni or students from several universities, including uh, University of Texas at Austin and a, um, Northwestern Polytechnic University in China and also University of Science and Technology of China. So these are all my, uh, say, friends, colleagues and previous, uh, uh, previous teammates, probably. Uh, I graduate, but I still have a deep connection with them. And then talking about these um, contests, uh, in our solution, I don't think we have much a special thing, but one tool that helps us a lot is the 
is this. Uh, I'm gonna send it in the chat. It's called Seismic Canvas. It's essentially a 3D visualization, visualization tool that helps you to plot out slices and you can drag through them um, to see, um, to check out the volume. And we use this tool to understand how our model is working. Uh, so not only looking at the number, we actually look into the data to see what it predicts and then to see what part of the uh, seismic data it is predicting correctly or incorrectly. And uh, the most helpful cheat that we did was that we throw out part of the uh, data that is away from the test data in the training set. So the training set is a large bulk, right? We just choose the one that is very close to the test data and then we throw away. So we tested before, we used the whole chunk of the training data and it turns out the far away side, the, the one that contains uh, say the channel, it was quite misleading uh, actually. If you use a whole training set to train the model, it will not perform as well if you only use the health closer to the test set. And then we get more and more aggressive. Eventually I only, only use very, li very little tiny part of the data that are close to the test set. And it turns out this is the best result. So that's what I want to share with you that you usually always check your data, always understand what your model is doing and always just, just go and double check if it's working as you expect it. If it's not, then find out the problem. And then eventually you will get something better and probably even get an amazing result uh, in the next round. So we will also try this approach in the next round and then hopefully we get something uh, interesting. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Yunshi. Uh, you know, since we uh, have a bit of time, maybe you can tell us, uh, you know, what is one thing about the challenge that you really liked and also one thing that you really hated and we can move, then we can move on to the next participant. Yeah, now if you have questions, uh, I can answer it too. <laughs> go on, go on, you can tell us what is one thing about the challenge that you really liked? Yeah, so I really like this contest because it's quite chance bearing. And um, I like the data too. Um, it was quite high quality because um, I know seeing a lot. We published quite a few papers before using the same phase one salt data. Uh, you can see my publication was we use yeah. that to uh, say detect salt body using segmentation method. We also use that to change something to change the, uh, the fault detection. Um, but this one, the Perihaka data, um, it is quite, <clears throat> it is quite uh, good. And then the labor quality is also good. Um, also, we like the fact that we can see a little video of um, error map uh, for each submission so that we understand what we're doing. Um, so not only a number, again, not only looking at the F1 score or accuracy score, we can see this exact map. At first, I was wondering, I was worrying if somebody is going to do some dirty trick of manually uh, tuning the uh, submission and then get that. But uh, it's good that you, you, you hide out 40% of the uh, data, so we still, it's still quite fair. Uh, nobody's going to cheat in that way. So uh, that's what I like about this kind of this. For the not like, uh, I think it's quite good. I couldn't find any way to. Uh, I participated in a few Kaggle contests before, and this one is a, overall the communication the discussion is quite good. I really like it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Yunshi. Uh, Yunshi, this is in, in round two because you're going to go and yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, no, my go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It, um, it'll, it'll be interesting your approach throwing well, but part of the data uh, that's furthest away from the the, um, the actual test data. In round two, obviously, you're going in the opposite direction from round one with the test data. So uh, it'll be, and that one has more, uh, you know, as you know from uh, from geology, uh, that is more in the dip direction. So there's more changing structure in, in that direction. It'll be interesting to see how that works uh, in in round two. Um, so. But interesting, Thank very interesting approach. Uh, great, great. Thank you, Yunshi. Let's move also, on to... Uh, Prashant, yeah, go Prashant, on. <laughs> just to kind of add on, you know, it's a very community-specific thing, not very specific to the problem. But this whole notion of, um, uh, you, you know, meeting uh, a bunch of people and then becoming really good collaborators, friends and whatnot in a conference is a very, uh, you know, nuanced aspect of academia, which I think brings back nostalgic memories to many people who have a kind of, uh, you know, out of, who have been out of their PhDs or have left ac academy at some point. But that was a broad note. I would let uh, Vrushang get to the details of the um, agenda. Okay. Thank you, Mohanty. Let's move on to Sagi. Sagi, are you here? He's joining us from uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. Yep. He's, one of the, he's also one of the top participants. Yeah, go on. So is yours. Okay. 
Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sergey. I'm from Russia, from Gazpromneft. That's uh, one of the biggest Russian company in oil. And I believe most of my uh, research approaches to the models, to the data, data augmentations, are already told by other participants. Like, I also tried the unit version, the Dplot 3 plus version to the model. And, well, I, I experimented with it a bit, but, you know, models are looking pretty much the same for every one of the participants. And regarding the data, I also use the trick to cut from the training sets only a small part that is closest to the actual test set. And I also found out that the results are generated by this model is, well, they are way better than from the training on the whole training set. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? I believe that uh, I actually think that I want to double down on the point from the, uh, I believe, Bruce, uh, that our industry is not a solvent and is very closed, actually, unlike most of the others, like medical segmentation and such. And even getting the data from different departments in the same company can be very, very hard. It's like all the departments are very separate and getting the data is pretty much impossible. So getting some historical data like from the previous cubes, from the previous fields is next to impossible due to the fact that all the prohibitions from different lawyers and all that can mess with this. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I have much else to add. So if you if you have some questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, so again, maybe we can start with just uh, your impressions of the challenge overall, and your same questions so, that I asked you. Me, that was actually a huge learning experience because I'm working in the field for well some time now. It's almost a year in the geological field, and previously I was just a mathematician and machine learning enthusiast. And regarding the closest of our industry, uh, it's been very close. It's actually not only in the data department, but in the technology department as well. So communicating with other geologists and knowing, learning from them in their explainers and whatnot was like really helpful because in our company, there are only so much things that our guys know and so much things that they can tell us. So learning from other explainers like geological attributes and all these things was very helpful to us. So that's a huge, huge benefit from this contest. It's like already used in our work in our day, daily job. So uh, that was a huge help to us. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Have... Sorry. Yeah, sorry, go on, Monty. Now, I have another curious question. So, okay, so you release one of the most helpful notebooks on the um, uh, platform uh, for people to get started on while you were still uh, like right on the lead on the leaderboard because you had one of the earliest scores. Why, why was that? What was the motivation behind that? And um, in general, your thoughts, it's not very specific to the machine learning aspects of it, but it's like very tied to the community aspects of it, which I personally am very passionate about. Well, it is quite obvious that everyone has pretty much the same model. It's like encoder decoder like thing that you cannot hide. So that part and considering the fact that all of our libraries that I use in my in my solution are already open sourced, and that was a huge deal because it was quite hard to open source the seismic library, you know, that is prohibited by pretty much all the laws of the uh, industry. So I feel that sharing is better than keeping the score high and whatever else. I hugely appreciate that. And and actually, I would like to take the actually, the trick of uh, cutting the train was in the in that notebook. It was not heavily emphasized because, well, that was the thing that kept my score high for a while. But you know, I didn't hide it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. You know, Mohanty, now it's time that we can actually reveal the leaderboard. What do you think? Please go ahead. I'll let you do the honors. 
I, I hope because okay, I will make an announcement because we always have this demo fail. Please ignore the noise in the background. Uh, but uh, we have this demo fail uh, in the sense that uh, every time we kind of do this leaderboard reveal, uh, there's an awkward silence of 30 seconds where I have to make awkward jokes. So I will not do that this time. I'll let Vrushang handle this. So Shivam, please, let's do a st stable uh, leaderboard release. Okay, guys, hold on. As we update the leaderboard, then we'll quickly go through the leaderboard. You know who are the final winners? That's about it. Mahanti, do you have at least a drum roll that you accompanies this? <laughs> I, I had asked Vrushan to kind of add some sound effects, but we're still figuring out the technical details. Yeah, no, it's it's not easy. Okay, uh, so I think let's do it. Vrushan, uh, you uh, so we do have that awkward uh, thirty-second uh, silence. So please bear with that. While the share screen is shared and we roll the leaderboard, it doesn't work in the first time. The second or third time, it works. Uh, Shivam, it uh, works. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, so here we go and update it. So it should be live now. Oh, okay, I promise you, even if I had access to the data, I haven't seen the... Uh, you know, private leaderboard myself because I was also following the leaderboard quite closely. Okay, uh, the leaderboard has been, you know, updated. Uh, is the score same? Or... Okay, so I guess we have the winners, Vrushank. Let's uh, do a, you know, announcement of at least the usernames. Guys, please put up some uh, profile pictures so that, you know, we wanted to kind of put the, use these profile pictures in general, uh, in all the social media posts in general. And social, these profile pictures are great visual identities for, uh, uh, a broad um, set of contexts in these sets. So uh, we have a winner. Uh, Vrishank, do you want to just go over the list of winners? Yep. Who are getting so uh, congratulations. Uh, his name is Voronov Fart, <laughs> which is, well, I've just pronounced it. But anyway, so his name is Artem Voronov. Congratulations. Are you with us? Yeah, he's, he's here. Let me, uh, yeah. Hi, Artem. Yeah, hi everyone. Congratulations. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Yes, we can. Uh, we would love to see you though. One moment. Uh, it might not be possible for him to switch on his video because he's a participant. Yeah. But anyway. Logistical difficulties, uh, no worries. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, we'd love to kind of hear from. There yeah. is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> well, we'll wait for my DJI drone. <laughs> <laughs> Try to avoid uh, Lois uh, yeah. in Russia because they were strict about drones. So, about uh, challenge, it was very interesting. Uh, uh, I knew, get knew about this channel uh, about a few weeks ago before the deadline uh, by the post in ODS. It's uh, uh, mainly Russian, but international that science community. Uh, so uh, it remembered me uh, last year, uh, a Russian company, Rosneft, uh, provided almost the same competition for the um, seismic data, multi uh, segmentation. Uh, there was uh, almost the same task, uh, but uh, there was uh, inter interpolation of data. So we had a grid with uh, marked uh, uh, images, uh, X lines and in lines. Uh, and uh, in this competition, we had uh, some kind of uh, extrapolation that was a little bit easier uh, to solve, uh, but uh, with poor quality. Uh, but anyway, uh, my solution gave me that score that I think is quite good. Uh, what main moments of my solution? Um, I honestly can't provide all till the end of the second part, second stage of competition. 
uh, but main ideas, it's uh, UNET, as everybody used uh, decoder and coder, uh, and it was extrapolation. So again, give details, I think, uh, after the end of second stage, uh, but uh, what I liked in the competition, it was, uh, it was kind of interesting to solve because it's extrapolation, uh, so we don't uh, know ground truth of uh, what we have next after some uh, distance. Uh, and uh, I was very surprised to see uh, this kind of media on the leaderboard that showed, uh, that can give some um, thoughts about what other participants used, uh, how they solved the um, task, or they do extrapolation or they uh, learned the algorithms on the whole set and uh, just predict some random slices and so on. Uh, even more, uh, maybe somebody could use um, this media to save the label test set. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Artem. Uh, you're on mute, by the way. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, we will kind of do that. I know we are late, but I there's a very important question. So, Artem, do you think you will hang in there in the first spot for the next round? Uh, can Can you repeat, please? Do you think you will hang in there in the first round, uh, in the first place for the next round? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, there's some competition right there. But we have some other people who are just behind you. And Prashant, please, I'll, if any of you are there, let's just, uh, you know, okay, we are almost out of time. It'd be good to kind of, uh, you know, just at least uh, hear five, 10 seconds of you. So we actually get to know you, not just your user handles. And please update your poor profile pictures. So next up we have the second person, the second uh, person to win the, on the leaderboard is Aditya Singha. Uh, I don't think he's here with us right on this town hall, uh, which is okay. So congratulations, Aditya. And after him is the SFIC team, which is uh, the team that uh, Yunji is part of, I think. Yunji, you're here with us, right? Yeah. Um, yes, um, I'm the uh, Texas Wombo, uh, if you wonder who that is. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. And after him, we have Sergi who's uh, in the fourth oh, oh, Wait, wait, wait. No, that's a very important question again. Do you think, Yunzi, that you will be able to get the first position in the next round? You know, it's a very important question. We There's a challenger right there who just claimed he would get it. We haven't thought about it. We were trying to uh, split the, uh, the ward. You know, it's a DJI. It's only one jump, but we have five people. Yeah, I'm thinking of five. Different... I'm thinking of just disassembling the rotors, and so we have four. <laughs> That's even, hey, you even better if you if you if you if you win uh, round uh, two, you'll be able to buy enough drones for your uh, for your team. <laughs> that's our spirit. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> also, congratulations to the other winners too. No, no, that's when you win round two, and then you buy a lot of drones, take a picture yeah. of it, and say, "Guess who has more drones?" <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. All right, which one goes up next? Sergey. Sergey. He's a, he's here with us as well. Yeah, of course. Congratulations. Well done. And uh, congratulations for winning the drone. You wanted that drone and you have it. And as yep. it happens, Sergey no, will get No, 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 no. <laughs> That's for later. Uh, who's uh, up next? Uh, that's it. We have the top four winners who are getting oh, okay. the drones. All right. I, I guess then we go into the community contribution uh, prizes, which yes. was something also very close to my heart because... Uh, I pushed really hard to kind of make that happen, right? I had to pull a lot of strings. And uh, also for the drones, uh, I had to pull a lot of strings. But it was uh, um, in general with a lot of people who kind of thought this idea could work. But I love the idea that it incentivized a lot of people because many people use the idea that drones work. Uh, so yeah, uh, Vrishank, do you want to talk about community prizes? You know, actually, before we move on to the community prize, I'll like to give a shout out to Mohanti. Uh, the thing that Artem mentioned about the media, it was Mohanti all on his own. And he spent about one or two sleepless nights, I think, isn't it? To get the thing working. Oh, sorry, my, I was on mute. But thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> I still do not understand the context, but I'm glad. No, no, Sergi said, right? He said that the media was very helpful. 
Ah, okay, all right. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that I had a very good feeling because when uh, actually uh, the context is that Mike gave me access to the data, and I have this very bad habit, which probably our executive team at AI Crowd does not like. Whenever I get interesting data sets, I spend a few obsessive days playing with the data set myself, like I was a participant, and then I was like, I really want to see this. So I wanted to ensure that uh, everyone else gets to kind of do that. Uh, okay, great. So now we have the community prize winners. I'll sort of quickly take you through each of their names. First is Sergey. His contributions have been very popular. They've had about more than, in total, I think more than 50 to 60 likes. He he gave great notebooks with amazing data explorations. And that, that also sort of produced very good scores on the leaderboard as well. And overall, it was a very helpful contribution that he did. Next up, we have Santiactis. I don't think we have him with us. Santiactis, do we have you here? I... Uh... In the interest of time, let's just move on. Yeah, he's here. With... But anyway, okay. congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, so next we have uh, Shubham, Shubham AI. And after him, we have Ivan. We have Leo City and we have Dills. Congratulations to all of you guys, all of you. So initially we thought that we're going to give out six, uh, sorry, four drones, but the contributions were so good that Mike, Nuhanti and all of us were sort of decided that it's going to be six and all of you are going to get drones. So congratulations to you guys. Well done guys, well done. Well done, well done. Thank you. No, I personally was very happy to kind of see all the community contributions that came in. And I'm glad we had a hard time deciding who to give uh, prizes that we say, okay, let's just uh, expand the um, uh, broad spectrum of prizes we have. All right, so I think we have managed to uh, um, announce the prizes. Uh, Rushang, what's up uh, next on list? I think that's about it. Uh, Mohanty, you can take the floor. The, and... uh, I guess next up, we still have important questions that need to be asked in the panel discussion. While the traditional plan uh, was to kind of have um, a broad set of uh, experts, I think it's okay to kind of open up the discussion to also uh, any of the winners who are kind of on the call. And uh, we had a broad set of questions that uh, we wanted to kind of ask. And if participants want to continue asking questions, uh, that's also completely fine. You can use the Q&A feature. If that's confusing, please jump in on the chat channel, write a question. Someone will ensure that it reaches to us. And also for um, any of the winners who are around and have access to video, please uh, feel free to just open the chat and ask a question because uh, many of the, these uh, communications were happening through user handles, which were from AI crowd and whatnot, but we luckily have Mike and Bruce uh, also here on this call who have been hugely instrumental in ensuring this whole thing happens before AI crowd was even involved in this. So this is kind of an opportunity where you can ask all the questions you have. If you do not ask questions, I have a whole bunch of questions here in my notes. <laughs> So, uh, all right, I'll open up the floor for questions. I'll wait for 10 seconds for the first question to come. Please do not be shy. That's 10 seconds up. Um, Okay, so I, I will bring up some questions, uh, but, but honestly, I would really, I, I do not understand. This has been one of the most active challenges we have had in terms of broad activity, discussions, the quality of results and whatnot. In most of the town halls that we organize, the amount of questions, they keep coming forward where someone has to moderate. We have to kind of hire, uh, you know, ensure there's two or three people whose job is to ensure the good questions get definitely bubble up. And here we don't have questions. So it's clearly you and UX issue. Rashank, we need to uh, fix this. But coming back to the key questions, uh, one of the key, uh, questions which bubbled up on the chat and uh, in the Q&A forums was around GANs. GANs are very interesting. Many of the uh, of us have been um, very obsessed about it. The key question was, can we actually completely remove the need of Bruce to begin with, right? Because Bruce has already labeled the data. We take all the data and we train a GAN, which basically, uh, you know, generates some more data from us. Given that the GAN is generating the data, we already know the labels in some form. And can we use that to train? So, Mike, I would open up the floor in that context uh, with like two subsequent answers and then follow up questions. First would be to Mike. Mike, what are your initial thoughts? on that. Yeah, I'm the wrong person to ask for that one, actually. So my, my training is in 
geophysical remote sensing, how the images are produced. I would pass that over to, we have other members of the, of the CMAI team here. So Rami is, is one of our uh, experts in data science. Rami, you have some comments on that? Well, I mean, my, I, I did reply to one of the answers. As of now, I don't even think we have enough, uh, you know, enough data to train uh, again. And that's been quite difficult. And also, even if again, the, and the main difficulty is that the, what a geologist has in mind about what is a, a possible geologic interpretation is quite subjective and I'm not saying that in a reductive way but in a way that you cannot quantify an objective function with it so easily. So even after again generate something you still need a lot of interpreters to say yes this is plausible or not this is this is really not plausible what the GAN is uh, is generating. So uh, it's not it's not as easy as 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 we think I it is. I, yeah, this is Bruce. Uh, yeah, go, ahead, um, go ahead, Bruce. I think one of the critical things about utilizing GANs, which is an, definitely an interesting technology that we're, we're certainly investigating, is the concept of stationary, um, the stationarity of the data. Um, data and the patterns, the faces, the properties, they all have very distinct spatial distributions associated with them. And those spatial distributions are different from one part of the world to the next. Um, you know, even within a similar geological region, um, there's an, in order to get what I would call enough variability in there, I'm not exactly sure how a GAN would do that. Um, a GAN would make potentially fairly similar versions or perhaps higher frequency, lower frequency versions of a model that you gave it that would have similar spatial distribution of properties. I don't currently understand how a GAN would vary those properties spatially in a meaningful way. Um, that's the issue I have. And again, it goes back to what Rami said. If we had a thousand different volumes we could use as training data and then the GAN could draw up on a thousand volumes, that's, that maybe we're in a different position. But right now um, we have relatively few trained volumes that the GAN could draw upon as, as what it wants to make. Uh, Bruce, Bruce. Uh, Bruce. Mahanti, maybe a couple of quick comments on that um, as yeah. well. Um, uh, one of the goals of SEAM actually is to do automated model building, geologic model building. And there's a lot of technology that's been de developed in the last few years for that. So literally, you know, almost have a neural network or uh, a machine learning algorithm with other deterministic algorithms, build realistic geologic models. And then we would have a large rich set of models to train on. That's a long way off right now, basically. Yeah, so I mean, if you can do that, the, the granularity of the model becomes the key thing for the faces. Yeah. Now, if you're to do this, say for faults or for maybe some other types of binary segmentation classification issues, there, there's maybe a more tractable path um, in the near future. It's the granularity of the detail that's necessary for faces. Um, in order for them to be useful training data that we're, we're, we're still very much um, trying to understand what's necessary um, yeah, in terms of the data granularity. Um, I don't pretend to know that answer, um, but it's a problem. And, and just maybe one last comment from a geophysicist point of view, which is where I come from, there is an interesting problem that's just kind of independent of the seismic facies interpretation, which is this. The seismic image that you get conceptually comes from having a model in which we have these discrete interfaces between different layers as Bruce described. And then as he also described, it's not actually how the data is collected, but you could imagine it's collected this way. We send a seismic wave form vertically down through that column and at each interface, a copy, a reflection, which is a copy of the initial waveform that we send down is generated and sent back to the surface. There's an interesting problem, which is taking a final seismic image or even the raw data and isolating those individual reflection events. If you could do that, and it's very hard because there are many hundreds of reflectors and they overlap, they vary in space. If you could do that with a 
a neural network. That would be a huge advance in seismic data processing because there are lots of bottlenecks in the seismic data, pro data processing chain that, that require uh, an interpreter to identify those individual events and then the time at which they arrive because that's tied to the seismic velocity, all kinds of other things. So that is an interesting one that I think is kind of, you could abstract away from the geological context because it's the same thing that happens in ultrasound imaging and medicine. And maybe there would be an interesting uh, role there for GANs. So to build upon that, I wanted to connect to a few points that Bruce said, which have a really important theoretical, um, Again, please ignore the noise. I had very important theoretical uh, connects in context of how we analyze GANs, right? Because though uh, I think you basically uh, talked about, again, I forgot the exact terminology that you mentioned uh, about, but you were talking about these many special cases and uh, you were curious about how you could kind of learn about how any model could learn about so many special, uh, you know, unique points in, uh, you know, when we are talking about the theory of how we kind of train GANs and all this stuff, the classic term for that is modes. So basically in a data distribution like this, you have many modes and that makes it a very hard uh, problem to kind of uh, train a, um, any kind of GAN be um, set up, which can uh, generate data, which has uh, th these many um, modes. But the question is, as, uh, as soon as these many unique cases increase, uh, increase the, um, uh, the common sense basically says we need more data. And that has been the com comment across the forums uh, a few times. My question is, if we want more data, we know for a fact, if we have a lot more data, we can train uh, in a more stable and reliable way, a much better GAN, which can generate some simulated data. We don't even know if it's possible or not, because again, as you mentioned, there's too many modes in this data. My broader question to both Bruce and Mike is, if we wanted 10 times the amount of data that we had right now, how much more resources and time would it take? If I wanted a hundred times the annotated data that we have, how much more time and resources we would need. And if I wanted a thousand, 10,000, a million times, how does that distribution look like? It's, and the uh, resources, again, <laughs> you can see money or all of this yeah. stuff. <laughs> again, well, we can it's, go it's, the it's, classic academic way. We need these yeah. many grants and this much time. <laughs> um, it's an it's a, it's a interesting way, a thing to speculate about. What we can say is there, there is a lot of public domain data out there. Um, if you go to the New Zealand website, there are what a dozen or so uh, data sets like this, uh, just in the last uh, modern data sets that you could use. There's some in the North Sea. The hard part is getting them trained or getting the training labels uh, so that you have something that you're confident in. But maybe the maybe the way to go is to try to do some unsupervised uh, classification of these and see how far you can get. That would that would sort of remove the bottleneck. Um, uh, some of them have been interpreted. The other thing I can tell you the SCG is working on is to uh, open up these, these data vaults in, in, the, uh, in the, its member companies, the, you know, the oil company, oil and gas companies. It's not easy, but one thing the industry has, um, has recognized is that this is a huge part of the future of the technology for the industry. That was what the 90th an anniversary meeting of the SCG was devoted to. Uh, and it's, that was the theme, um, not you know every single session, but many sessions there. And I think the uh, the leaders of the companies are now beginning to realize if the industry is going to benefit from this technology, which has largely been developed outside of the oil and gas industry, it needs to open up its its coffers and get some of the data out there. There are lots of examples going back decades are no longer active oil fields, so you'd think we could get them. But as Bruce said, it's hard. It's very hard. No. Um, yeah. No. Um, maybe to to speak more directly to um, your question about what the effort would be involved and maybe what the pathway involved is. I think that there's, you know, these two approaches. One is to perhaps put a lot more effort into making synthetic models, in which case, um, if you can make the synthetic models available, um, acceptable in terms of, uh, or useful for the training data, then you have a direct pathway into making a million models if you so like. Um, but that, that is a big challenge, making them acceptable in terms of being able to actually train the neural network on synthetic data and then have it operate successful, successfully on real data. But the other, act, the other way forward is what I would regard as 
essentially, unfortunately, uh, um, just a, a hard work phase, which is in all of these publicly available data sets, or to some degree, the industry has to agree to collaborate a little bit more, is all of the participants have to essentially crowdsource this problem and take a look at a variety of different environments, whether it's from carbonate systems of the Middle East or whether it's deep water systems off of Brazil or whether it's um, you know the Permian Basin in West Texas is come to some decision that uh, you're gonna open source a certain amount of data um, and make it available. And to some degree, you know, put your interpretation out there and be prepared for people to not like it. Um, I'll be honest, it was one of my concerns about putting my name on this interpretation is it's a very, it's a age old sort of axiom is if, if you want 10 different interpretations, just put five geologists in a room because each geologist has at least two different interpretations and, and they're not going to agree with each other. But um, I think we have to attempt to crowdsource this a little bit. And that means some labeling these data, labeling these volumes is hard work for a few weeks or a few months. But once you've done it, it, it then becomes an institutional knowledge base moving forward. Um, and so that's what I'd say we need to do over the coming you know, year, two years, three years is people just need to label these data sets and put them forward. Um, and if we do that, then we have a good chance to make some progress. But if we don't do that, we're gonna be stuck trying to figure out whether we could make the synthetic volumes work, work, work for us. So there I, I would like, again interject a little bit. I personally am a huge open, seed crusader, open source uh, crusader, right? I really love open source and I try, I've been engaged uh, for quite some time and um, I continue to stay engaged in there, even uh, apart from my capacity in context of AI grant. But for a second, let's say open source is not financially sustainable in the long run. For a second, let's hold on that thought. I'm still trying to figure out a solution around that huh? in context of AI grant. But let's say that is not sustainable. And in this context, in the question that I asked before, my goal was to kind of inspire some entrepreneurs who are in the audience right now to kind of come in and figure out if I had to go in and figure out how to annotate this much data, how much would it actually cost? And can I actually somehow create some impact while ensuring it's financially sustainable? So my question is, let's say these huge organizations are not interested in open sourcing the data, worst case possibility. Then do you think at any point of time, a private entity can come up with a sustainable business model which can create the same data set at a huge, huge scale, which relates back to my previous question on how much does it cost in terms of resources and time to create 1x, 10x, 1000x, and a million x of the same uh, data set that we have right now? Um, Mahanti, I can give you a little bit of context for that in, in terms of the other scene projects that we're building synthetic models. Um, it's still a time-consuming and expensive task. So um, the SEAM um, 2 project, which is about land seismic, built um, three um, models that are industrial scale, uh, every, every bit as large and nearly as detailed as, as the model that's underlying the Parahaka data set. Each of them took about a year to construct with um, three or four professionals uh, working, not full-time, but part-time like Bruce did on this to construct the model. It's not interpret data, it's construct a model, geologic model that's detailed using software. And each of them costs about a million dollars to um, to build and simulate because you need to build them and simulate. And actually it's the simulation part, the seismic, generating synthetic seismic data that's the most costly part of that. Uh, now that cost is coming down in the same project that's ending now. Uh, we built two models and the cost of each of those models was much less. So uh, both the technology and the computing power is driving it in that direction. But I think you're still talking about, I think the hardest job actually is what you mentioned, getting a creative entrepreneur to come up with the right business model that, that, uh, that realizes that there is a marketing. I think there is for the major oil companies and there are other applications as well. Engineering companies need this type of analysis for 
uh, understanding civil inf infrastructure, geophysical remote sensing is being used for that. And there are other applications in, in environmental waste monitoring, carbon capture and storage, et cetera. So that's, we need, we need better thinking about the business models as well. Uh, so on that note, I would just give a reminder to the audience that if we have a creative entrepreneur in the um, audience who somehow got inspired from this conversation, please consider taking this up, uh, up front because as Bruce mentions, there's huge impacts in terms of huge impacts in terms of what we can do with the data that is collected. Right now, a lot of um, the tricky bits are around because we cannot collect large scale data in sensible ways. That's why again, now we can still go and explore uh, and synthetic ways to collect the data and whatnot. But that's um, still, if we can figure out a way in which it economically makes sense to collect large amounts of data like this and just release it out there or release it conditionally under an open source license or a closed source license up to you um uh, but with enough conditions so that researchers can start working on this then you'll be accelerating the broad um, uh, you'll be catalyzing the broad progress in the whole domain but those were pretty much all the questions from my end i would hand over the floor to mike to, uh, you know, on a broad set of uh, sentiments, unless anyone else wants to kind of jump in and share some notes, I would hand over the floor to Mike because he has been hugely instrumental in making it happen. And before Mike ends, well, after Mike ends, I will jump in a little bit to thank a bunch of other people who made uh, this whole thing happen. You know, we did have a couple of participants who wanted to ask questions. Maybe we can take some of them up from the chat or from the Q&A. And I think... Yeah, actually, but um, unfortunately, uh, maybe maybe let me say a few words on behalf of the CMAI project, because I do have to drop off in, in a couple of minutes, actually. Um, so, um, Mahanti, I, first of all, I want to thank uh, you, Vrishank, your team at AI Crowd. This is the uh, first part of this, we're not done yet, has been uh, has been tremendously helpful. We view it as a, as a great success uh, for our first competition. Uh, thank all the participants that, um, that uh, got onto the AI Crowd. Challenge uh, submitted um, um, solutions. You know, posted their comments and their notebooks. Um, please join us for round two. Um, we, that will run for at least four weeks. We may extend it to six weeks. There are cash prizes at the end of round two. We'll re be releasing uh, another test data set, um, and we'll be publishing new metrics because, as I mentioned, we're eager to get the scores um, more reflective of the uh, geologic realism of, of the models and. Uh, Bruce and and uh, others on the CMAI team have put a lot of work into into thinking about that. It's an area of research, actually, getting better metrics for scoring the um, you know how close geologic models are uh, is an area that has really not been been worked on very much. Uh, so uh, we have some thoughts on that. You'll see that in the algorithms that we publish. Uh, and then last but not least, I want to mention this platform that we're helping to design with one of our member companies, Zarathus, X-A-R-T-H-U-S. Go to Zarathus.com. We'll, we'll post a link uh, on the AI Crowd challenge page. And there you'll be able to see some of the, um, some of the, the, um, uh, the uh, software we're developing to assist in the uh, inspection of these, including something which someone mentioned, actually a 3D data viewer, where you can pan and, and slice through the data in different ways and, and see, see what it looks like before you start uh, designing and, and evaluating your network. So um, tremendously grateful uh, to, um, to AI Crowd and the AI Crowd community for this, and we look forward to a successful round two. And with that, um, uh, Mahanti, I will have to sound off in about two minutes. But thanks yeah, again. Unfortunately, uh, Mahanti, I'm in the same position. I have an 11 o'clock uh, uh, deadline that I need to sign off by as well. Okay. Maybe it's just you and me, Bruce. Looks like <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we are all here. No, no, I'm I teasing. was uh, awaiting Mohanty. Okay, Anyways. just a second. I had to kind of run off a little bit, but if at all any of the I know Mike has to kind of leave, but if any of the participants have any other questions, I'm happy to kind of jump in and just have a conversation, a casual one. And if Bruce is around, that would be super helpful. Uh, uh, Bruce um, and I, it looks like, yeah, yeah both of us no, have to drop off. And Mohanty, unfortunately, I have an 11 o'clock. Um, engagement yeah. that I have to drop off for as well. So uh, I, 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 okay, no worries. Uh, I, 
But I, we have others. Uh, Adam, I don't know if you can hold on for a little bit. Um, if any of the other, uh, Constantine, if any of the other CMAI uh, members can continue on, that would be terrific. Um, but if not, we'll we'll do this again at the end of round two, of course, and uh, we'll look forward to further discussion on your online chat rooms, et cetera. So uh, again, thanks so much and well done. We will uh, look forward to continuing into round two. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, what I actually realized from this whole session was that we need more participants talking to both Bruce and Mike, you know, that's yeah. very important. We need to kind of make that happen a lot more often. Um, but uh, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for all your insights. Okay, take care thank all. You. We're I'm signing off. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Uh, if uh, we still have questions from participants, I am not a domain expert. I do some deep learning here and there, uh, a decent amount, but uh, we still have uh, among the top participants who uh, uh, have done really well in, uh, in this particular round. If we have any of the questions, we'll be happy to kind of answer those. You know, there's a lot of energy. It's been about two hours and we have Retain. Okay. All right. Because there's still a lot of noise and these guys cannot deal with me continuing with the call for this long. But I can hang in for a little bit. And uh, if there are more questions, I would actually very strongly encourage you. Guys, yeah, stop making noise. I would really encourage you to uh, drop in those questions um, on the forums. Or please uh, drop in an email to me directly at mohanti at aicrowd.com. Okay, then that's about it. I think we can close it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this uh, town hall will be up on our YouTube channel very soon. And uh, you know, look, we we'll look forward to round two. Thanks a lot. And round two is going to be even more fun with uh, even better prizes. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Actually, on that note, we will be announcing some new prizes. Uh, for round two. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to announce that. Am I? No, even I'm not very sure. Oh, sure. <laughs> oh is it recorded? Please bleep out the sh <laughs> part. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, have a great uh, day or night based on where you are. It's night in India. Uh, it's a day in US. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.